Hello and welcome back. So, in this class we are going to talk about um, magnetic resonance image acquisition hardware and uh, so called pulse sequences uh, just to give you an understanding of how images are acquired. Uh, we will also understand some of the contrast mechanisms better. Okay. Okay, so, this is the overview of the class we will look at some of the um, hardware that goes into uh, MR image imaging system. Uh, I call it instrumentation, but we will we'll only be looking at it superficially in a sense just seeing what the components are. So, we will look at you know the main uh, component the magnet, the gradient coils, uh, the radio frequency coils, the electronics and it contains of course, we will not go deep dive into electronics, but just saying that these are uh, some of the uh, parts of, a, of the scanner and the imaging console. Okay. So, uh, for the as far as the magnet is concerned uh, it is a main component and uh, this is what is required it is also the most expensive among the components. So, it is act typically a superconducting magnet it is a cylindrical superconducting magnet a cross section is shown in this figure like if you see it is a cross section of the magnet and it is it is it basically has a superconducting wire um, which in this case is niobium titanium wire immersed in liquid helium which is held at 4 Kelvin. Okay. But, uh, but that particular wire is superconducting at 9 Kelvin. The helium itself is inside a cryostat, it is encompassed by a vacuum and liquid nitrogen. Okay. So, these magnets require uh, you do not have to keep filling liquid helium often, but liquid nitrogen refilling is required. The field strings vary from about 0.5 Tesla to 3 Tesla. Uh, there are, of course, 9 Tesla uh, magnets also available. Some of the higher field magnets are used in small animal imaging for instance biomedical imaging and also as research uh, magnets. Okay. So, uh, the interesting part here is that once uh, it is basically uh, the wire is wound around a, a cylindrical core. Um, so, uh, it is just energized once right. So, as soon as the critical temperature reach you energize it once which means that you inject current into it and the current keeps on going because it is superconducting there is not much loss due to resistance of course, over time all of it will uh, uh, you know will dissipate. Okay. So, this this leads uh, to the uh, magnetic field being set a static magnetic field being set up. So, static magnetic field will point you know along the axis of the core of the magnet right and uh, it is typically like I said between 0.5 to 3 Tesla modern clinical magnets are either you know 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla. So, I am not sure where these numbers come from, but I guess um, these are what are possible given the constraints of size etcetera. So, uh, like I said, but since 9 Tesla magnets also exist. So, one problem that you will also run um, study about um, is if you get into MRI is that maintaining the uniformity of the field is a challenge, which means that you know across the cross section right at every point we have to make sure that it is 3 Tesla and so on and so on and that is uh, that is hard to do. So, there are some constraints like that. Um, so, it is it's basically a superconducting wire wound around a cylindrical core and once the clinical temperature is reached using liquid helium uh, you inject it with the current and that current keeps going giving rise to a magnetic field that is the static magnetic field that you use for imaging. Okay. Um, there are now systems you know economical systems where people are trying to use permanent magnets um, and there are the portable uh, systems etcetera where they are trying to use permanent magnets or maybe you do not need uh, such large magnets because if you are just imaging peripheral organs right you do not need such large magnets. So, which brings down the uh, cost of the system. So, a lot of research going on in that area. So, the gradient coils now we will see a little bit more about this later on. So, these gradient coils um, are also uh, they are basically current carrying wires right um, these wires give rise these current carrying wires give, re, uh, give rise to magnetic fields. Um, they, they are fit inside the bore of the magnet. Um, so, there are three coils each one of them um, orthogonal producing magnetic field gradients orthogonal to each other right. Um, the gradient coils do not change the direction of the magnetic field right they just add an x and y and z dependency on the magnetic field strength. Um, and the magnetic field which I am talking about here the static magnetic field and it still points along the z axis. Um, and the x and y dependencies are, are produced by saddle coils and z uh, gradient is done using two opposing coils wound around the circumference. I have some pictures I think I will show you. So, what do you mean by it does not change the direction of the magnetic field 
So, we saw the um, let me see if I can draw some here a very small okay. So, here this is our uh, cross section of the core. So, the direction of the magnetic field is here right. So, now we want like let us say it is a 3 tesla magnet. So, we it will be we would expect that let us take this random points here we would expect the, the magnetic field to be 3 tesla everywhere okay. So, typically that is true um, uh, if as long as if you are talking about you know a nominal field of view. However, no, even when I say a gradient coils what it does is the direction of the magnetic field is still the same it is along the axis z axis, but the value here will be different the value which means the magnitude of the mag magnetic field if you can call it that right. It just creates gradients in this okay if this is the value of the B field everywhere it just creates a gradient along each of these directions right for instance in this case it is along x which I have drawn here. So, uh, the gradient just changes the value, but not the direction of the field the field is still along z uh, along the, the static magnetic field still points along the z axis right. So, and to in order to produce these gradient, uh, gradients you need you know current carrying coils of different shapes configuration in order to produce these gradients. So, that is what I said earlier that you know there are uh, so for instance x and y dependencies are produced by saddle coils uh, z is done using two opposing coils found around the circumference of the cylindrical core okay. So, here are some examples right of the gradient coil. So, for instance this is the gradient coil we talked about right two um, this has two sets of uh, wires bound in opposite directions these are the saddle coils we talked about kind of right x and y gradients. So, depending on the you know how we make these coils you know the uh, gradient is produced along each of those directions okay. Um, the gradient amplitude again is limited by the current in the coil it is very high currents right it is very high 100 to 200 amperes right. And just to give you an idea of the order of magnitudes the maximum gradient uh, amplitude is 1 to 6 gauss per centimeter or in this case 10 to 60 milli tesla per meter right. So, uh, about the strength of our uh, magnetic uh, you know field the static magnetic field is about 3 tesla right 1 2 3 tesla is what we talked about and this is the gradient amplitude. The switching times this is important because you know when we look at uh, pulse sequences later on. Uh, we will assume that you know these are instantaneous which is not true there is something called a slew rate. So, it is kind of takes time for the gradient to uh, turn on right or to reach its maximum value. And uh, you know because of this constant uh, switching of currents uh, turning on and off of currents there are again eddy currents are induced in the metallic components of the magnet housing right and distorting the gradient field. So, there are again shielding for this etcetera. So, once again here we go deeply into hardware so, these are the hardware challenges in designing a magnet for um, a system for imaging right. So, you can imagine so we have the cylindrical core you are you have already have a uh, you know a superconducting wire which is of course, inside a vacuum um, you know uh, on both sides there is a vacuum. So, it does not touch anything, uh, but, but still you know you introducing these current carrying wires will lead to some distortion in the magnetic field and these current carrying coils are you know wound around in specific shapes you know once we saw saddle uh, coils and these are circular coils etcetera and they will also produce some distorting field. How do you handle all that that is a challenge in some of the hardware design uh, for MRI right. Um, so, there are some limitations for uh, by, uh, due to the gradient coil the self inductance of the coil again that is what prevents rapid switching of yeah, rapid switching of the gradients and you know coils can be made smaller you know, but if we make the coil smaller then reduced the field of view is reduced right. Um, so, there is another actual um, hazard by uh, in this case to the patient because uh, this rapid switching uh, the presence of currents uh, etcetera can lead to eddy currents in the patient right. And uh, so, um, so, there is some limit beyond which we uh, switching speed beyond which you know the uh, there is some nerve damage uh, and so, uh, there that is the limitation that you also have hardware limitation um, or in this case biological limitation uh, on the hardware right. So, <coughs> once again these are other sets of challenges that go with uh, um, uh, designing MR hardware. Uh, the radio frequency coils as you have seen is basically um, this is these coils is what it produces that B1 field right as we call it the B1 field they produce the B1 field. And this coil induces the spin precession and these coils actually also measure the current induced by the spins right. So, we want to uh, measure the echo spin echo which we see later these are also done. So, this RF coils do both 
the uh, excitation of the spins as well as the measurement. Though basically, it acts as both a transmit as well as a receive coil. There are all kinds of coils, volume coils, uh, which surround the patient. Surface coil you just put on top of the patient. Uh, they are basically in close proximity to the patient. Okay, and again, designing these coils, you know, how to get the correct RF field, RF out and uh, shape the B field magnet etc. This is again a field of study research in itself lot of groups people working on this right. Once again this is one of the hardware challenges in designing an MR uh, scanner right. So, uh, the radio frequency coils again comes with different uh, you know configurations I have listed some of them here. So, if you are into RF transmission you know etc. you should read up more about this um, and how to design these coils what each one of them produce you know how I know the um, acquisition electronics for these things right. Um, so, but uh, just to understand for an understanding these frequency these RF coils once again can surround the patient or can be just in close proximity to the, proximity to the patient and they can be used for um, uh, both transmitting and receiving RF. The transmitted RF is what causes the spin uh, precession and uh, there is uh, the, uh, the induced currents are measured by the receive coils right. So, um, again there are surface and volume coils like I said earlier right and uh, the other uh, uh, thing to also keep we keep in mind is that you know the transmission and reception require very different current amplitudes in the coil ok. Because the uh, emitted current is kind of very small right you are talking about uh, the uh, spins in our body um, uh, causing a current and those currents are typically much smaller than the B1 field related currents right. So, you have to uh, worry about that also ok. So, there is typically a scanning console like all other uh, diagnostic uh, devices. So, like for, for instance CT also has one. So, the, uh, the console helps you interface with the MR hardware, uh, it helps to select the imaging planes uh, set ECG gating, respiratory gating etcetera ok. It is also connected to the uh, reconstruction engine. Uh, so, that the acquired data is then used by the reconstruction you know just may be it is a processor embedded system or maybe just another workstation which can uh, reconstruct maybe 10 to 50 images per second. So, MR is real time imaging system it just uh, it might uh, it can be an image real time imaging system uh, it does take some time to set up, but uh, you can do very fast frames. For instance, one application of MR imaging um, is the cardiac cine MRI as they call it is a specialized hardware for it you can actually uh, image the entire volumes of the heart in one cardiac cycle right. So, several volumes can be acquired in one cardiac cycle. So, that that kind of speed is available of course, it comes with uh, this is a separate protocol that has to be installed in your scanner. Uh, but again once again you know this is uh, the reconstruction is real time can do 10 to 50 images or maybe more these days ok. So, um, let us go back to um, how uh, we actually acquire data right. So, we saw the principles of MR um, you know signals how they are produced right uh, magnetic resonance you know what does it mean or nuclear magnetic resonance in this case what what we uh, how do we understand it how do we model it etcetera right. But then we are now going to look at you know in the context of imaging you know how do how are images acquired using magnetic resonance nuclear magnetic resonance phenomena and uh, that has to that that leads to something called pulse sequences. So, in this uh, next maybe uh, uh, half hour a few hours or so I do not know even less we will try to understand how you know these um, this is implemented in an MR scanner right. So, how do I, how do we image planes how do I how are how are we imaging uh, 3D volumes of the patient etcetera ok. So, what um, the uh, fundamental steps are the following we have what is called a slight slice selection gradient, there is a frequency encoding gradient, I think this is also readout gradient I think this again one more terminology. Once again if you are not familiar with the uh, terminology it is fine, um, if, if you want to ever get into this research you should know, but otherwise um, it is just follow along. There is a phase encoding gradient and um, followed by image reconstruction right, this is the four steps. So, the what does uh, what do each of these do and how are they used that is what we are going to see. I will also present uh, some uh, so called pulse sequence uh, diagrams to understand you know the image acquisition process ok ok. 
So, um, why do we need the size selection gradient? What is it used for? So, now we know that you know for, for the mag as far as the MR system is concerned we have a fixed set B0 field right. Okay. So, the um, Larmor pressure frequency is, is proportional to B0. So, it is the same throughout the sample. Okay. So, when we apply the RF pulse you know it tilts we know that it, uh, it kind of tilts the, uh, uh, the static magnetization into the plane and uh, that and the processing spins in the plane induces an EMF, but all of them are uh, the special frequencies for all of them is, is, is proportional to B0 right. And it does not really help because we will just get one FID we saw that too we will get one FID if you can measure that and but that does not tell you where the signal is coming from what is the spin density for instance in a particular x y z location ok. So, how do we go about doing this? So, the first step is to isolate the cross section by applying gradient fields this is what we want to do ok. This is where the gradient coils come in right. So, we know what the RF coil does this is where the gradient the gradient coils help to localize x y and z positions we will see how it is done ok. So, if we apply the so called slice selection gradient right the which is basically the gradient along the z axis. So, once again remember the uh, direction of the magnetic field is still along z okay just that its magnitude varies is varied by the slice selection gradient so what happens is once you apply a gradient at this rate right so, so many tesla per meter or milli tesla per meter times z the precession frequency this is the precession frequency becomes a function of z you can see that here right so by applying a a slice selection gradient in this case that is why it is 0 0 g c right that we the x and y gradients are off first we apply the z gradient. So, it, it makes the Larmor pressure frequency in the volume a function of z right when I say function of z here this, this is exactly that function right. So, in this case you can see we have encoded the frequency as a function of position right. So, now once we have this at the same time we apply the RF excitation pulse. Now, since the RF excitation is at a specific frequency there is a bandwidth we will see that in the next slide there is a bandwidth associated with the RF pulse. So, it will only excite tissue in a thin section it will only excite tissue with a thin section right and and what is that thin section that thin section would correspond to all the points whose z position uh, has the specific field dependent Larmor frequency right. So, in this case your uh, RF pulse has a certain center frequency and a bandwidth and whichever z position corresponds to that central frequency and bandwidth because now we know mu is a function of mu is a function of z and uh, that only those pins will be flipped into the plane ok right. So, that is the uh, that is the idea behind introduce. So, this means that we are now only looking at a certain cross section of tissue ok. So, we look at it better. So, if you look at this a mock up of the patient lying on bed. So, this this red line so, uh, the uh, this is the z axis. So, uh, if you look at this uh, mock up uh, illustration um, the x axis just indicates the direction z along the length of the patient right. Now, you are looking along so this is just a side view think of it like the side view and this is the precession frequency right. Now, this is actually a function of z that is what this implies right. The red line that you see there that shows the strength of the gradient which means that as I move along z on either side my precession frequency is slightly changed because of the presence of the gradient right. If you go back and look at this expression it is gamma b 0 plus g z into z right. So, remember this expression this gamma. So, at this point the gradient is 0 let us say right and as we move to the right and to the left see this is the precession frequ the frequency keeps increasing right. So, uh, which is what is shown in this picture. So, the the red line just indicates uh, the uh, strength of the gradient right. If it is a shallow slope it is a very weak gradient if it is a sharp slope it is a strong gradient. So, which is what is shown here. Now, what does it do because it is shallow going a, a small delta right this is the delta of precession frequency right and that leads to a very wide slice correct 
right because the uh, the gradients amplitude is small a, a very thick slice of tissue will have uh, will have spins with pretty much the same precession frequency see that's what that formula also tells you okay so my nu and gamma look the same sorry about that but uh, have to uh, I just understand that part okay so but if you make a very strong gradient which is what is shown here then you know if you go from you know if a, a small this is that uh, the bandwidth if you can call it in your rf pulse that leads to a very thinner thinner much thinner slice for the same bandwidth delta nu we get a thinner slice because the gradient is much small sharper which means that if you go a very small delta z there is a big change in the precession frequency right but that is what the gradient does right because when you go with the if g z is very large sorry, if g z is very large let us say right it is a very large number then if you move a very small distance along z then your precession frequency becomes very uh, changes very very fast right that is what that is uh, that gradient does. So, which means that you know if you have a very small uh, bandwidth in your radio frequency signal that will select only a very small or thin slice of tissue. On the other hand if your gradient is very small even if you go uh, for your uh, precession frequency to change considerably you have to go a very uh, longer distance which means a thicker slice of tissue. So, for the same bandwidth in your RF signal you will get a thicker slice or a thinner slice depending on the strength of your gradient right. So, that is what is uh, shown by this illustration ok. So, um, so that is this way there are two things you can do you can select your slice thickness. So, you localize your um, uh, your uh, your spins and you also help select your slice thickness right. So, this is the um, idea behind the slice selection gradient. So, slice selection gradient are uh, and the uh, RF pulse are kind of turned on simultaneously. So, you will see that in the diagram. So, this is a typical uh, diagram that you will see in lot of textbooks as well as you know papers etcetera ok. So, a constant z gradient is applied. So, that is what this is. This is the time axis the, the blue lines of the time axis ok. So, a constant z gradient is applied ok and there is this uh, this do not worry about this right now we will talk about it later when you get the chance at least more detail. Um, this is called the refocusing gradient. So, the well I will just maybe I will tell you right now. So, um, the idea is so once you apply g z for a specific period of time right because the slice thickness is finite right we have a finite slice thickness there is a, the uh, there is a difference in the precession frequencies because they are between the within the edges of the slice right as you go from one end of the slice to the other there is a difference in the gradient because of the gradient and so consequently there is a difference in the precession frequency. So, at the end of application of this uh, gradient there will be a uh, defocusing of the or defacing of the spins ok. So, that is that is because of the difference in the uh, uh, magnetization or the magnetic field uh, felt by the uh, expo, um, felt by the spins in the left side and the right side of the from the like going from the left side of the slice to the right side of the slice you there is a gradient z gradient which means that they have slightly different frequencies which leads to the defacing. So, to reface them we just have to apply another uh, negative gradient same amplitude but for half the time ok they bring that back into phase ok. So, that is what this is for this this indicates. So, this uh, just to explain the diagram in slightly better detail. So, this is when you turn on the z gradient once again this is slightly ideal idealistic because the z gradient cannot come on instantaneously there is a certain time before it sets and it comes on and it is this is the time period to which it is actually kept on ok. And the time t equal to 0 actually starts here which coincides with the peak of your RF pulse and and then of course, you have the re uh, this negative gradient for refocusing gradient uh, refacing gradient and followed by which there is the FID ok that is when you turn on the ADC ok. But if FID is actually very difficult to measure you typically measure something called the echo ok we will talk about that later. But this is the slice selection process the way you select the slice uh, do a slice selection is along with the RF pulse you turn on the z gradient now again the z gradient is determined by you know how thick where which position and how um, uh, you want image and how thick a uh, slice you want image right. So, the FID signal that you obtain now 
uh, after the refocusing um, or I call it refacing, but it is a refocusing gradient will correspond to the summation or integration of the signals from all the spins in the slab of tissue right. So, if you go back, so whatever signal you are getting will be from here again or from here depending on your gradient strength because only those will correspond to the Larmor pressure frequency which the RF pulse will flip into the plane ok. So, this is the slice selection gradient. So, but even now only this is just one slice right we just do not know we still cannot figure out x y yet. We have just localized the signal to a particular z location or a range of z location. This because that is why you always talk about slice with uh, in medical imaging, uh, even in the context of CT as well as MRI. MRI because the uh, tissue that image you are looking at, even though it's flat, it's an, it's a, it comes from a, actually a slab of tissue, not just an infinitely thin plane. That's a bad approximation, right? So, the slab of tissue is what we have localized, we still have to do x and y localization. Okay, so, we will look at a couple of uh, uh, derivations just to understand what is going on. So, we saw that you know the uh, precession frequency is a function of your uh, B naught or as usual plus your gradient. That is so your precision frequency is now encoded by your uh, z position at this point. Okay. So, now if you consider two positions you know z1 and z2 like we saw in that picture let me go back up and just show you what z1 and z2 are. So, you can you can say let us say we can we can call this uh, we can call this z1 this point um, corresponding to well, why do I call this z1 and z2 because they, they actually correspond to here right. So, this we call this z1 and z2 right. So, these are again similarly here you can call this z1 and z2 right. So, this will be some delta z, this is your slice thickness, this slice thickness right. So, now we can actually show, so for instance for z1 we can write uh, due to this is a simple manipulation, so I will not go through it in great detail, right. Similarly, for Z2, we can write And we can then uh, figure out after some algebra, we can just write your slice thickness as a function of this delta nu divided by your gradient amplitude. Okay. Okay. So, this is the uh, expression that you know the slice, the slice thickness tells you how we can determine slice thickness by figuring out this delta mu as well as by figuring out your g z you can set the slice thickness ok. The slice position which is basically the average can also be written in this form which is given by this I this, this is gamma bar minus gamma 0 sorry mu mu bar minus mu mu 0 divided by gamma g z ok. So, this is again the slice position right. So, all of these two are the important expressions right. So, that is that is one set of equations right. So, another aspect is basically the RF waveform right. So, what kind of RF waveform do you want? So, based on this derivation we can say we des we, de we desire a, a, a frequency signal right uh, whose frequency content is given by some amplitude it is a rect function right times a rect function of mu minus nu minus nu bar by Delta mu, delta mu. Okay, so which means that the signal. So wh what do we want? Because we just need a you know a, uh, a rectangular pulse along the frequency axis, right? Corresponding to that particular frequency mu bar of a certain width delta mu. Okay, so um, that and the signal itself. You do the Fourier transform. We can do that. Signal can be defined to be. A delta nu 
processing function of of delta nu t is to j nu bar t okay all right so this is uh, this is basically what we are looking at and in this case you know um, we, this is a sync function so we can plot it and this what we get is if if you if you look at it uh, the envelope of this sync function is what i will plot right so which is something uh, this is along the time axis right something like this right it's a sync function and of course if you want the appropriate localization along the frequency axis you will have something the ideal uh, thing to that right right so this is this is along the frequency axis right this is along the time axis so um, so these are the expressions which help you determine you know how what should your rf pulse look like ideally and based on that you know what is your z position as well as your slice thickness okay so um, this this is the overall uh, model behind the slice selection gradient okay so now we can move uh, move on and we can talk about how do we localize along the um, x and y direction or basically how do you do in plane localization right so this is called frequency encoding or I think sometimes um, it is also called readout uh, uh, frequency encoding direction is also sometimes known as the readout direction. Okay. So, as we, saw, as we saw the signal received is basically the uh, integration or summation of signals from the excited slide. Okay. So, as we say, saw that the signal received is now restricted uh, that is basically the spins that are flipped into the plane uh, by the particular angle depending on how long you have the RF pulse on. Um, is uh, is is only from a certain slab of tissue, right? However, we don't still have localization. Basically, no x comma y information or in plane localization is present. Okay. So, how do we spatially encode MR signals? Okay, and uh, the way to spatially encode the one fun process is referred to as the frequency encoding. Um, in this case, there is a gradient, additional gradient, which is turned on during the FID. Okay. And the direction in which that gradient is turned on is referred to as the readout direction, and it's typically orth and it's orthogonal to the slice selection gradient. Okay, and we would typically the readout direction is the x-axis, uh, the z-axis being the uh, along the length of the patient, and that's the that's where that's the axis along which we apply the slice selection gradient. Okay, so what is the signal model for this? We we'll just do that um, quickly. Uh, before we uh, go any further so the uh, this the, the signal in the plane right um, the transverse magnetization after being after an alpha excitation that is after this films have been films have been flipped by angle alpha so the m x y of t is given by 0 plus as you call it e raised to minus j 2 pi where the symbols have their usual meaning um, one second. And this is m x y and this other term just after is it's basically just before you flip um, times sin alpha. Okay, that's the what we have. Okay, so we have this uh, spins in the excited slice, um, and we want to model the spatial distribution of you know the proton density. Uh, T1 and T2 um, and we assume that the slice is fairly thin so that there is no variation of course it is not entirely true there is that variation but we assume that it is fairly thin. Okay. 
but there will be some spatial variation of the transverse magnetization immediately after the excitation right. And uh, the, the received signal then we can model as as the signal that we get due to that m x y okay. and that, that relationship is typically written in this form. So, I would not go through every inch of this derivation, but just to understand the origin of the signal that we are all working with. So, the signal that is acquired that is uh, that is received by the coils is actually the function of the, the magnetization that has been flipped into the plane, but since there is a variation right uh, because of the variable there is some variability uh, in the magnetic field etcetera there is a variation in m x y right. So, that is why we have to integrate m x y and uh, that a is some, some amplitude it, it, it all the other constants have been absorbed in a ok. Now, this this is the general signal model that we will be working with right. Now, we can once again we can uh, we can make it further simpler simplified by uh, using this expression f of x y is the same as a of m x y. I am excluding that is 0 uh, times 0 plus um, actually maybe I should not. So, then your signal becomes your signal becomes this this integral So, basically the received signal if you demodulate it because the d raise to minus j 2 pi mu, uh, nu 0 t is a very highly oscillatory right nu 0 is a very high frequency oscillation. So, you have to demodulate it. So, if you demodulate the signal it is basically just this integral right which is the integral over the spins uh, spin density or t 2 relaxation times etcetera in that particular slice right. So, then we still need something to make sure that we can uh, uh, localize x and y ok. So, the way to do that I what a uh, way to do that would be to apply a gradient along the x axis. So, what happens if you apply gradient along the x axis? So, the gradient along the x axis would correspond to your 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 frequency your Larmor position being changed the following way ok. Sorry I have used plus ok g x is the strength of the gradient along x ok. So, this is how mu x changes right. Um, so, of course, you can always compare it with you know, if, if we, we when we did the slice selection gradient we apply another gradient uh, we apply g z changing uh, changing it appropriately. Now, we have once we remove that g z right. So, everything reverts back to b 0 gamma b 0 right gamma b 0. So, then now if you apply the x gradient again it is gamma b 0 plus g x into x right. Now, once we have this then we have to modify the expression we had written uh, right here appropriately right because it is no longer gamma mu 0 nu 0 t right nu 0 has been modified because of the presence of the x gradient. Now, when we do that then we can all you have to do is let me just write this one expression so that uh, we understand where we are going from. So, if the signal we are talking about then becomes a right there is a e raised to minus j 2 pi news see which of new 0 you have new 0 plus um, let me a new 0 plus your gamma g x x into t right. 
and then if we have the exponential minus t bar t2 dx dy. Okay. So, the part that is changed is when then we can still take out d raise to minus j 2 pi nu 0 into t. So, then what you will get is that signal that you are measuring right is basically this right. So, this is the important concept in MR imaging right this particular equation. So, you can now identify so we have what we have what you have done is uh, now identify the position with the frequency right. So, uh, we can interpret this expression as a Fourier transform with uh, one of the frequencies in the case frequency corresponding to y, y direction being set to 0 right. So, how do we how do you do that? So, you can set v equal to 0 and uh, we can also set u to be equal to this expression. So, then if you plug it back in there and you can, you can see that this is this the expression we have is the uh, form of a Fourier transform right. So, instead of uh, uh, gamma g x t you just put u and v u set to 0 right. So, u x u x uh, plus v y right. So, if you just want to write this, if you write this as some function uh, f 2 infinity infinity f of x comma y e rise to minus j 2 pi u x plus v y d x d y right. So, if you said v equal to 0 that is the expression we have there right, said v equal to 0. So, this is basically in the form of a Fourier transform right or in this case you say yeah the Fourier, the Fourier transform where we are trying to uh, you know uh, integrate over your spatial variables right. So, we have the spatial frequency uh, corresponding to u and v being defined by here yeah. So, this is the uh, way we encode positions using the gradients right. So, this is one of the fundamental equations for or this is the fundamental equation for understanding MRI where we are where we interpret the signal as the Fourier or the Fourier transform of, of the quantity you are trying to measure. So, this f of x y encompasses everything right it, it tells you about the magnetization as a function of x comma y it also tells you about you know the, the relaxation the spin properties t 1 and t 2 times. So, in this case t 2 as a function of x and y this it is already encapsulated in f of x comma y ok. And the application of the gradient along x captures again uh, you know makes it in the form of a Fourier transform. And tip and one of the in the uh, the terminology that uh, in, in, in MRI is that it is called k space right. So, you will call u would be k x and v would be k y. So, that, that is this is this is referred to as k space right. So, you would have to uh, measure all of k space right. So, in order to figure out uh, uh, the Fourier transform and then you do the invert it right. So, that is that is where that is why that is the acquisition um, strategy in MRI right. So, this is the first step towards for uh, casting it in the form of a Fourier transform ok. And the way to actually measure would be to scan the so called k space right by by you know by taking on a range of frequencies and how do you adjust that by changing your gradient correct. So, that is one way of doing it is to change the gradient or the most effective of doing it is changing the gradient by changing the gradient you will capture a variety of k x and k y and therefore, that, that will give rise to your uh, your Fourier uh, transform that is a k space acquisition and using that you can reconstruct your image ok. That is the interpretation of uh, uh, image acquisition in uh, in an MR signal in an MR system ok. So, how does it work in the uh, for frequency encoding? So, as you saw the FID is still the integral of all the spins within the slice ok. Um, 
but the Larmor frequency is, is what we try to do is to uh, modify it according to position within the slice namely along x. So, because we apply the gradient along x. Okay. Now, this leads to a FID signal that has position encoding right. Once we and we saw that then this signal can be interpreted as the Fourier transform of this pin density um, in this case which is m and of course, it also is a function of t 2 right. Um, the frequency variable we identified as, uh, um, as gamma g x t. Um, however, in this particular acquisition mode uh, with one gradient it corresponds to v equal to 0 right. So, this is the uh, pulse sequence diagram r of turned on the gradient along z also turned on for slice selection the refocusing gradient followed by the application of g x it is it is turned on again this this along the time axis it is always on and during which we uh, we actually do the ADC right. This leads to our image being uh, which is like scanning k space, but you know you see that the, the, this here equally corresponds to a certain uh, uh, v equal to 0. So, we are stepping along u, but v is still 0 right. So, ADC of course, samples these signals in time u is given by gamma g x into t. So, that tells you it gives you the whole range of views of course, and of course, we have to change v in order for us to uh, you know sample the entire case space. So, how do we change v that is another question we will answer that in the next slide. Okay. So, the MR signal model we have already seen um, just to recap um, um, we, I will write this down as we saw the application of the gradient leads to the following signal right S O T. Then you made the identification that uh, u is this expression, and this case v is zero. Okay. Now, how do we do this scanning, right? We now we saw v equal to zero. Then how do we change uh, change this, right? Um, so the way to do that is also to apply another uh, gradient along x, right? So if you apply another gradient along x, was well, along y, so then your signal model would be. should be a signal model right. And so, from here we identify the Fourier domain frequencies as x t and v as right. And so, what is the Fourier trajectory that we are that we are uh, sampling here? The trajectory we are sampling here is obviously, we are going in this direction theta as tan as arc tan g y by g x right or if you want to plot it. So, if you are looking at the k space diagram so to speak, so u v by changing g x and g y in appropriate steps you are basically sampling along a certain direction like this that is theta. So, it will be sampling kind of radially by strain changing the strength of g x and g y you will you will end up scanning you know along arbitrary directions you know and then once you have scanned the entire uv this is called polar scanning so once you have scanned the entire uv space of course you can do interpolation onto a cartesian grid and do the reconstruction okay so, this is the polar scanning uh, protocol okay um, so here um, just to summarize again the scanning the fourier space requires the repetition of pulse sequences too like we saw because one we only have v equal to 0 so, we have to scan um, for different values of u v in order for us to get to the uh, appropriate positions in k space. Okay. So, this is accomplished by an additional gradient along y direction it is called a g y gradient. Um, 
and the application of gradient along x direction with 0 gradient along y made the radio direction x and of course, the directions can be changed in this case we sub we, the, uh, we apply both the x and y gradients simultaneously right and the pulse uh, sequence has to be repeated with different gradient strengths to cover the different k space trajectories. Okay. So, if you want different angles then you change the strength of the gradient you get a different angle and then you sample along that direction. So, that is the idea behind uh, the polar scan uh, kind of a pulse sequence this is what is shown here everything else remaining the same x and y gradients are turned on simultaneously and of course, you do the ADC acquisition as function of time. Okay. So, this um, once again and of course, we keep changing the strength of g x and g y to get different angles right. So, that is what we saw. So, the theta the angle at which you scan is given by the strength of g x and g y. So, by changing g x and g y. So, this I think this is not very clear. Right. So, by changing g y and g x you can get different angles and then of course, you sample along that direction. So, that gives you the uh, <coughs> k space trajectory. Okay. So, this is for a polar scan again once again this is probably not uh, this is just for the concept right. There are different ways of traversing it uh, traversing k space. Um, the other way uh, is the phase encoding right. Um, so, here once we saw polar scan is one technique to traverse k space in 2D. Um, I do not think that is a very common thing to do, but that is I think one of the earliest things that was done. Okay. But phase encoding is what is done more commonly. Okay. So, the frequency encoding is used for read out along u the u direction in the in the k space and the phase encoding is for read out along the v direction. Okay. So, we for the way it works is we do a slice selective R of pulse followed by a refocusing gradient we saw that the usual and this is the this is the one we are talking about right. This is the R of pulse sorry selection gradient this is usually standard you will see this everywhere ok. And uh, then you apply the y gradient with strength g y for a certain duration ok um, achieving phase encoding right. Read out direction is then applied while acquiring data ok. Uh, then the pulse sequence is again repeated with different strengths to cover the entire k space trajectory. Now, we might wonder ok. So, first we will look at this diagram first right. So, what we do is we have the usual uh, R of pulse applied along with the slice selection gradient refocusing pulse F i d and of course, usually in the diagrams this this comes after ok. I have just put it so that in time it looks great nice ok. So, you apply the phase encoding gradient for a specific period of time right and then you switch it off and then you apply the readout gradient right now and you uh, acquire the signal at the same time. So, what does this accomplish? So, typically what happens is like so when you have the uh, RF uh, selection slice selection uh, gradient on then all the spins in that particular slice have been tipped into the field of into the plane and into the x y plane and they are all processing with the same frequency. Okay. Uh, which is basically corresponding to whatever uh, gradient plus the B 0 field is. See applying the phase encoding gradient and switching it off. See once you switch it off they all go back to the previous uh, the B 0 right. So, what does applying the phase encoding gradient uh, uh, accomplish? The phase encoding gradient imparts a phase change. So, they all may might be rotating in the same frequency, but they will be off by a phase right. So, the phase it so every so it, it, it gives you a a position dependent phase okay, to the rotation if precession to, uh, to the precession and that is preserved even after the removal of the gradient g y. So, j the uh, the phase encoding gradient all only does that it gives you a uh, position dependent phase value and then when you do the readout gradient when you have your uh, uh, gradient on uh, as you are acquiring the data then there is a position dependent frequency also added into the mix. So, the way that model works um, let us just so there are there are some um, uh, we will look at the model first, but before we go any further I have been kind of uh, very superficial about this times time axis here right. I am just indicating some arbitrary times I have not indicated what these times are these times are actually specific 
specific times right there is something called time to echo that is when you measure there is a time to repetition because all of these have to be repeated for different values of g x and g y right. So, when we do that you cannot do it right away. So, there is a time gap between these repetition that is called time to rep uh, repetition time or time to repetition T r and T e times ok. Time to echo is when you it is a middle of your measurement uh, time window ok. So, uh, this T e. So, all these are actually very crucial um, this, uh, this timings are crucial and I have not actually mentioned them I am just giving you a overall, ide overall idea of um, you know how these measurements are done. So, you understand how it is done right. Um, so, let us just go back to the um, signal model if you have the uh, phase encoding gradient right. So, the, fa the phase encoding gradient what does it do it is it is not too different because now the one thing you have to um, again um, remember is that we are applying the phase encoding gradient for a fixed amount of time ok applied for a T p right. And so, the signal model so uh, we will write down the signal model, but before that um, uh, we, we have to see how what is the phase accumulated due to this right. The, the phase accumulation like I mentioned before is the function of position which is Okay, this is the value, this is the phase accumulated. So, your signal model then becomes So, now your u is basically uh, this value as usual and v is. So, this T p is fixed kind of figure this out uh, what you should be. So, uh, this is your baseband so called baseband signal right of course, it is modulated by that exponential um, e raised to minus j 2 pi uh, nu 0 t which I have not indicated here this is the d mod this is the d modulate this is 0 is the d modulate signal and this is how you scan the uh, k space right. So, but by you you change u by changing the gradient you change v by changing the gradient so on and so forth right. So, that is how you uh, uh, to different levels of u you can change by changing the gradient similar things you can do for v right or for the for what you do is you for different values of the gradient and the same time uh, you will get a different v right and then you keep v u constant and you can sample that way also right. So, that is typically how it is shown in all these images um, and all these pulse sequence uh, pictures which is I have not shown them here, but maybe at a later time I can actually um, show you how it is done ok. Because typically the the range of these gradients are shown because the gradient can go from some minus max to a plus max right and that is I have not shown here in any of these diagrams, but that is that is how we typically have to interpret it. We will look at some more um, uh, some of these uh, more practical uh, image acquisition pulse sequences right, but this is just to understand the model for your acquisition right. This is the model of the signal and how you can uh, encode your position right using these gradients that is a fundamental concept that would like for you to understand so that is how it that is how it works. And that f of x y that function that you are measuring as a, as a function of position is basically that has both the terms that has all the relaxation time terms as well as the magnetization density in it and that is it is just a complicated function that you measure. And so, your images that you measure in MR are both functions of so called spin density which is basically the magnetization as well as the T 1 and T 2 uh, relaxation times. These are basically the physical uh, quantities uh, that, that, that you are actually trying to measure by uh, using MR images right. Uh, so, this is a in contrast to C D image where the quantity you measure is actually uh, a function of electron density right. It is mu you are measuring for example, in C D images we saw you are measuring mu 
uh, mu is the attenuation coefficient which itself is a function of energy and atomic number right but it's it's actually more a function of density right so so what you are measuring is is basically the density actual physical density of uh, of of the object that you are measuring in this case you are looking at magnetization density um, as well as you know some relaxation time properties so this is more of a nuclear property that you are measuring right this is a, uh, the property of the nucleus you are measuring the specifically water so in ct you are actually measuring electronic properties so it's kind of similar but kind of different that way uh, the mesensi mechanisms of course are also different okay okay so one of the um, um, commonly used or say the practical should i say more i would say commonly used so the way the fid decays rapidly due to different effects right one is the uh, uh, you know magnetic field homogeneities okay um, so the spin the spin echoes are basically uh, that uh, this you can generate these spin echoes till your signal is completely lost due to t2 effects okay how do you generate this spin echo right so that's the that's the uh, that's that's what that's what we want to get at uh, before we go there we just have to understand that the echo that is fid that is generated right it decays due to the t2 effects as well as the t2 star effects right and this is very rapid decay so measuring that is slightly difficult but if you get a spin echo then you can measure that much easier because this fid is generated instantaneously as soon as you as you flip the spins into the plane fid starts generated and and it starts to die away right because the uh, the defacing effects or the defocusing effects of magnetic field homogeneities and the spin spin interaction is very fast right these are milliseconds or less so in order to get some more time for measurement so in instantaneous measurements are not possible so you get better and also to get a better amplified signal you measure spin echoes the spin echo is basically generated by applying a 180 degree r of pulse after the initial tipping pulse so you tip the spins into the plane or at some angle alpha using the rf pulse and then you apply one more pulse which will flip it another 180 degrees right so it basically reversing it or if you think of it as a 90 degree flip it flips into the plane and then if you do the 180 degree it will just flip uh, out the opposite direction so um so the what does the 180 degree pulse do the 180 degree plus reverses the phase relationships so if there is rapidly defacing so as soon as the spins are are uh, are flipped into the plane it starts to deface so once you flip one more 180 degrees uh, the direction of uh, defacing is the same so they will actually come together again to give you a another echo so another signal okay um so how do you interpret this 180 degree plus we can interpret it as sudden change in the sign of the frequencies both along the x and y axis okay so if the prior to applying the pulse the k position was uv then post application this can be interpreted as minus u minus v okay um so the uh, this enables uh, a lot of in uh, you know, what you call um, uh, image acquisition tricks we won't go into details but the 180 degree pulse the spin echo pulse is what is typically measured okay let's look at the uh, sequence okay so slice selection 1 on top you see that numbers have written 2 is the phase encoding step i think uh, yeah that's the gy gradient being applied Uh, following that you have the 180 degree r of pulse along with the slice selection okay so you got one more slice selection gradient and then you wait for a particular period of time this time to echo and along with that you apply the read uh, the read the uh, read out direction right so if you are not sure right here is the phase encoding this is the are uh, the 180 degree pulse with the uh you have to do the 180 degree pulse with the uh, gradient slice slice selection because you want to do the flip flip in that particular uh section right once that is done after waiting waiting period you apply the read out direction pulse and you get an echo okay so i haven't drawn the echo here but that's the that this is the general uh spin echo sequence which is kind of most practical sequence okay um so but uh, the pulse repetition interval this i spoke briefly earlier so in order to acquire all of 2d space right so we are only looking at now if you look we we just looked at one value of gx and gy 
So, in order to acquire all of 2D Fourier space, the basic pulse sequence must be applied with different scan parameters. Okay, so for for we only what I mean by scan parameters, right? So for polar scan, it has to be done at different orientations theta. Okay, um, and then all techniques must be repeated using different phase encoding gradient values, right? If you apply, you change the g y, then you get a different v, right? So this gives you different v's, right? And so every time, so you have one, you apply one g x, one g y. Uh, sample the signal you wait and that waiting period is the pulse repetition you wait a little bit because you want everything to get back to you know its stationary state and then you repeat the experiment okay so in this uh, you know fast and slow are possible slow meaning you have to wait a considerable amount of time before you do the next repetition okay and uh, fast is you know you don't really wait but you continuously acquire for there are and then each of them has its advantages and disadvantages okay there are some other things also that i have not shown so in all the figures, right? I've shown the uh, gradients to be turned on instantaneously. That never happened. There's a slope to it, so it's not instantaneous. Okay, and multiple phase encoding gradients. I haven't shown that at all, but it's typically that is required to transverse k space. FID is not acquired, right? Only the echo signal is acquired. That's the only possible thing to acquire. At least that's my that's the understanding. So the echo signal is a better signal to acquire, not the FID. All right. Okay. So, what do you do with the images, right? So, data acquired from 2D MR imaging, what we have seen are called 2D MR imaging pulses. And we saw that, you know, if you write down the signal model, it can be interpreted as scan of Fourier space, okay. So, so taking the inverse Fourier transform will yield the image, uh, but then it is not a simple inverse Fourier transform, you have to do a discrete Fourier inverse Fourier transform, right. Um, so, then the third problem that we, uh, other problem that we also talked about is that the interpretation is not very straightforward okay because the meaning of what you are what you are reconstructing um, cannot be explained very simply like CT I said right so it is a attenuation coefficient it is a function of density electron density or physical density of the object or radio nuclear imaging uh, wherein you know what you what you reconstruct is basically the radio tracer concentration. Um, and so, but then you know the, the problem is here it is not so straightforward, but we do know that f of x y we saw has multiple quantities in it depending on depending on how you choose the time to image right. For instance, imaging parameters like time to echo and pulse repetition time, they can enc encapsulate multiple properties. So, for instance, one property is the uh, spin density which is proportional to the magnetization, the other property is the T 2 relaxation time, one more property is the T 1 relaxation time, these are the three important properties that are captured by an MR image okay and that is the that is also the uh, uh, quantities quantities that give rise to contrast in these images like for instance uh, some some tissue appear bright some tissue appear not so bright or darker and uh, those those depend on how you uh, tweak these time to echo and pulse repetition times 